Hey guys, I hope y'all are having a good Monday. Uh, I just wanted to come to y'all with a little devotional today. Um, it was great seeing many of you back at church yesterday. We got to finally reopen. Um, it was awesome. I know several of you stayed home still, um, either saving space for other people to be able to come or uh, just still uncertain of, of the whole corona situation or not wanting to wear a mask, whatever it may be. Um, but it was great to have uh, a lot of people back in the room yesterday. Um, and after several weeks of leading to an empty room, uh, it was great just seeing everybody uh, engaged in worship. Um, I got to lead the 8 o'clock and the 11 o'clock services, and so it was just awesome to see uh, so many of you worshiping and, and so many of you that I haven't been able to see over the past uh, almost three months now. Um, and it has been a very weird uh, three months. It's been a very strange uh, start to 2020 um, with all of this coronavirus and the quarantines and everything going on, and now... Uh, a lot of the riots and the protests that have started in some of the cities across America, honestly, but um, in response to the George Floyd uh, murder in Minneapolis. And so um, that's kind of where today's devotional is going to focus a little bit, talking about what biblical justice looks like and what we as Christians are called to in response to some of these events. Um, see, the word justice sadly gets a bad rap uh, in a lot of circles. Um, many Christians kind of cringe at the term social justice, um, and I think it's unfortunate um, because it's a very biblical term, and that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, we kind of see it as like, oh, this party feels this way, and this political party feels this way. Um, but Shane Claiborne said, in the end, God may not ask how we voted, but God will ask how we loved, the hungry, the incarcerated, the sick, and the stranger. In this term justice, the Old Testament speaks of God's justice almost 200 times, um, depending on how you interpret a couple passages. And the prophets, specifically in the Old Testament, speak often of the justice that we, as God's people, are called to show. Not just God's justice for us about sin and wrath and those sort of things, but our justice that we're to show other people. Hosea 12, 6 um, is kind of our passage for today. Um, and it says, But as for you... Return to your God, hold fast to love and justice, and wait continually for your God. A more famous passage that people have heard a lot more is Micah 6, 8. It says, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, or to love mercy, as some translations say, and to walk humbly with your God? You see, the prophets of the Old Testament show a strong emphasis on the justice that we're supposed to show other people. And it's been said that, the prophets vehemently disagree with the idea that worship and justice can be separated. You see, justice is deeply connected to worship. It's deeply connected to our relationship with God. Because we've been loved by God, we're supposed to show that love to other people. As we worship God, as we see God changing our lives, we should reflect that to other people around us. Uh, we take the college students to Passion Conference every year, and one of the big slogans that they use often is that worship and justice are two sides of the same coin. Because when we see God, when we respond to what God's calling us to, it moves us out to those around us. It moves us out to those in our community, in our world. But it, it doesn't stop in the Old Testament. Jesus rebukes the Pharisees as hypocrites for tithing expensive spices while, quote, neglecting the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. Jesus is telling the Pharisees that you're focusing on the law, you're doing all the right things, and that's great. But you're not doing justice, mercy, and faith. And those are the things you should have been focusing on. Christians are called to serve the least of those around us. Jesus teaches that throughout the Gospels. And the Old Testament speak of justice being um, a trait that God's people are to, to employ as we worship the Lord. So how... Are justice and worship linked? I think it's the big question for us, right? Aaron I, the leading worship pastor at Austin Stone, uh, has written that our worship shouldn't be restricted to songs, but must be expressed through serving, giving, and being merciful as we reflect the one we worship. I kind of alluded to that earlier, but our lives are to be a reflection of who God is, not only who he's revealed himself to be, but also who he is in our lives. If we're going to love people, if we're going to do justice, we're only going to be able to do that to the extent that our lives reflect the character of Christ. We talked about that a couple weeks ago in a devotional I did uh, on Before the Throne of God, if you want to check it out. Um, but we reflect that which we take in. The music we listen to, the movies we watch, TV shows, 
the hobbies, the people we spend our time with. And not that that's a bad thing. Hobbies are good, music's good, people are good, right? But we reflect that which we take in. We reflect that which we spend our time on, that which we devote our time to. So the closer that we draw to Christ, the more we look like him, the more we look like Jesus, the more we look like who he's called us to be. Today's culture, we all know of agencies and programs that tackle social justice issues and uh, some that maybe listen and say, hey, well, that's their job. Let's, let's just let them focus on that. But sadly, you know, sometimes Aaron Ivey also said, sometimes the world appears to be more responsive to the world's brokenness than the churches are. Our culture has embraced a crucial aspect of the gospel more than we have, restoring brokenness. That's who we as Christians are called to be. That's what we're called to do. That's what Jesus does in our lives is restore broken hearts, broken lives, broken situations, and redeeming them for the Lord's glory, for his, his love for our lives, for our world, for our community around us. Yet the social justice offered by the world is, is, is great, and it does a lot of great things. Do not mishear this or misunderstand that, but it's merely a Band-Aid to deeper spiritual issues. Christians are called to push past this surface level, uh, tangible uh, social justice, if you will, surface level compassion. We want people to experience the depth and the ri richness of Christ's love and to walk in that relationship with him. And that's not something that these world you know, organizations or these, uh, these agencies can, can bring. We have the light of Christ. We have the hope of Christ within us, and we're called to share it with a world that's desperately in need of it. That is what biblical love, biblical justice looks like, bringing lost, broken, hurting people to the wellspring of life, to a relationship with the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. So what's the next step? How do we engage our neighbors and our community the way that Christ calls us to? You see, we are the body of of Christ. So we point to Jesus for hope, but we get involved for help. I'm going to say that again. We point to Jesus for hope, but we get involved for help. It starts with awakening our eyes to injustice around us. Our hearts are so often tuned to our own uh, situations, our own lives, our own desires, our own needs that we often ignore others. Not by active decision, not saying, oh, I'm not going to focus on what they're going through, but just by passive daily routine. We get so busy, so caught up, and I hope that one of the things that's come out of the corona situation is that it's caused us all to slow down. Whether you know you think that we should or shouldn't have, it has caused us to all slow down, to kind of re-examine our routines, our way that we go about our daily activities. And so we need to make a daily choice to put the needs of others as a priority in our lives, not just a sidebar or a footnote or something we do you know, for five minutes of our day. I know in this climate going on right now with the protests going on, with all that is in the news every second that you turn it on, everybody has their own ideas and their own political views on it, and, and I get that. Some see this side, some see that side. There's been reports of people that have been, you know, bussed in from out of state, out of city for the protest, but what's crazy is I've seen Republicans and Democrats both arguing that same point, as though if you're a Republican, it's Democrats that are bussing people in, and if you're a Democrat, it's the Republicans that are bussing people in, and I highly doubt that it's both of those. Um, the world always tries to paint everything as this or that, as you, know, you either believe this situation or you believe that situation. There is no gray area, there is no in between. If you don't agree with me, you disagree, but we all know that there's gray area all over the place. Life is full of nuance. Arguments aren't so polarizing. Our lives aren't so polarizing, right? But we all also know deep down, regardless of any of that, regardless of all of that, our allegiance is to Christ first and to his kingdom. Not to a party, not to a particular view on this topic or who's busting in people or who's not. Our loyalty is to see the world and to see others as God sees them, as his sons and his daughters. And our hearts should break for the lives lost, for the senseless violence on all sides, for the devastation that's, that's wreaked havoc in certain communities for, for generations, for centuries, to show love and compassion and mercy to those God loves, to work for justice in our world. God's justice in our world. 
Biblical justice can't be done from the sidelines. Reggie Joyner has said that proximity changes perspective. If we got close enough, it would bother us enough to make a difference. And it's such a powerful statement. For so many of us, we live in a community, it's a quiet suburban community, very isolated from a lot of these situations. And I get that. But for those who live in these circumstances, who live in the, the, the climate that we're talking about right now, it is a very real situation for them. But not long ago, it was the situation for us in Baton Rouge here. Just four years ago, we were going through many of the same struggles, many of the same difficulties. And regardless of what the situation may be today, tomorrow, next week, Mother Teresa also said everywhere, wherever you go, you find people who are un unwanted, unloved, uncared for, just rejected by society, completely forgotten, completely left alone. We have to get in the trenches to help people but to experience their reality. Only then can we know what steps need to be taken to bring the light of Christ to their brokenness. As we bring God's love and his justice to the lost and hurting our spiritual lives and our worship are enriched because we are actively engaged in helping bring God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And so we make the decision today to take up Jesus' challenge to actively live out what he's called one of the most important commandments, and that's to love our neighbors as ourselves. Whatever the situation is, right now it's this. But we have our own hurts, we have our own devastated communities here, nearby, in Watson even. And there are things that each of us have been called to that God has put as a unique perspective on each of our hearts and each of our situations to, to reach out and to, to bring healing and to bring hope to those communities. And so I challenge us to do just that. This devotional is going to end a little differently. Normally we've been singing a song um, that ties in with the message. But uh, this week I'm going to post a, a video below in the comments um, to a song that I can't do justice to. Um, but it's just an amazing, sincere prayer. Um, it came out in the spring of 2016, so before the Alton Sterling uh, protests here in Baton Rouge, before the uh, Baton Rouge police had, and EBR had several officers shot and killed in the line of duty, before the flood, uh, before everything that was so devastating for that year in our community. And I had heard this song not long before all of that started, and it's just such a beautiful, incredibly beautiful song and such a prayer. There's a line in it that says that all would see your glory here in greater measure. Through us, your church, your kingdom come. And that's our hope, that's our prayer, is to see God's kingdom come in our communities and our situations and to see God's glory here in greater measure. In Watson, in Louisiana, in Baton Rouge, in you know the south, in the north, in the U.S., wherever it may be. Because he is the God who builds he is the God who saves. He is the God who prospers. Evil has no claim. It's the line in the bridge. And that fervently we pray. And so we pray this over our community. We pray this over our city. Over these cities that are ravaged by violence, by unnecessary evil, by brutality, by hatred. We pray it over our nation. We pray it over our lives. So please go check out this video. Focus on the truth of these beautiful lyrics. It's just a simple piano, a little string part, um, and a girl, Andy, uh, or Rachel Graham, sorry, it's by Andy and Rachel Graham, uh, singing this song. And let it be our prayer right now for our situation, for this community, for our world, to see God's kingdom come, to see his, his beauty and his glory here in greater measure. See you guys, Worship Wednesday, uh, this Wednesday. Talk to you then.